and yeah, enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. I, I appreciate very much your uh, organization. I think this is very important that you have founded this organization and I really appreciate the volunteer activity of students doing this. And um, as we are not so many here today, it's like a workshop. It's a, uh, I think it's also possible that you can put your hand up and ask something uh, or you write it in the chat as suggested, you can do as you like. And if you write your question in the chat, then somebody will read it aloud and then I can answer. We can also have questions during the talk. Maybe I will stop from time to time because it's, I think the group is not too big to have the discussion um, lively. So I'm very interested in reactions if you want to share them with the audience here. So now I will share my screen and start the talk. And so please feel free to ask while I'm talking about the issues. Um, so um, I'm very interested in this topic. And as the uh, colleague has just mentioned, I wrote a book about the topic, Saisir, which was the reason was that I was um, after accompanying so many patients um, and also not only patients with eating disorders, but other patients that had problems with the body perception or not feeling well with their bodies and um, uh, problems with the self-worth. Um, then I, I saw some advertisement for um, a surgery, beauty surgery of the breasts just in front of our clinic. And I got so angry about the circumstances that are in our society very um, much su um, supporting um, dieting and very unhealthy um, um, body um, perception in, in a lot of people. And so I think I cannot talk about this here today without having a... I will now try to go in this modest. The content will be not only about the individual eating disorder or the development of individual eating disorder. It's also about the eating disordered society, how I call it, uh, society issues that um, lead to um, eating disorder problems in individuals. And also very important what to do in prevention uh, also for everybody of us, uh, what to do if we see it's coming, if we are at risk our, ourselves or we see we have friends or relatives. Usually when I do these talks, I, I talk a lot about eating disorders. And then I, I, I'm, what I do is I ask everybody in the audience, and here's a bit difficult to, because I can't see you, but um, I will ask you anyway, we can see you raise the hands, but. I ask everybody who knows a person that has an eating disorder, either a relative, a friend, or anybody. And I, I everywhere where I do this, then I see that almost everybody of the audience usually raises hands because it's very, very common to know someone, a neighbor, a classmate, a former classmate, or someone, a friend. Or, or a sister uh, that has eating disorder issues. Or, so this is really a, a topic that is widespread. Um, so when there's a, a, a high pre, 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 uh, prevalence. Um, now I will talk about some um, of the issues that lie behind the easy eating disorder society. And this is about eating and about food and how we perceive food. And there's something we call emotional eating. That means that in the act of eating, we use the food to cope with negative feelings like sadness or anger or something like that. And um, in German, we have a good expression for that. Um, Kummerspeck, that means that you have got uh, the obesity that comes when you do a lot of emotional eating. And 
Um, this is one, this is very widespread, this phenomenon in our society. And we are, I suppose nobody's completely free uh, about that. Um, and the other phenomenon we have is the restrained eating behavior. And almost everybody in our society, especially women, uh, know the, this phenomenon that we um, are constantly thinking about we should eat less than we do. And we start dieting tomorrow or today or tonight. So this is constantly a bad conscience about eating too much. And we always try to restrain our eating. And I will talk now about the consequences, the, which, and this is a, not an eating disorder, but this is a, an underlying mechanism. Um, we can see that people with restrained eating disorder, if they come under stress, like if you have some exa exams, um, then if, if you have restrained eating behavior, you tend to eat more, increase your food intake. If you do not have restrained eating disorder, which is um, also possible, especially young men, usually when you get older, you get more restrained, um, then stress leads to a decreased food intake instead. So this is, depends on your eating type. And here we can see the different types of eating, the restrained eating, the emotional eating, and the binge eating, which is another, another phenomenon that you tend to lose control and to eat without, uh, that you, and you cannot stop the process. Um, all these phenomena are quite normal in the um, in our society, but if it uh, becomes too much, it can lead to eating disorder behavior or to a, a, an outbreak of a, a real eating disorder, clinic eating disorder. And um, so you can see that the binge eater tends to, with the stress or with negative emotions, tends to have eating attacks, the emotional eater to increase consumption of sweet or fatty foods and the restrained eater, um, as we mentioned, to the increased food intake. Um, here you can see the phenomena we have in, in our society. Um, it's not only about the eating, emotional eating, restraint eating is also a, a, a tendency to, to uh, an exaggerated slimness ideal and a constant talking about dieting and you should eat less and a distorted body perception. It's not only an individual phenomenon. Of course, these are all symptoms of an eating disorder, but in some, to, to some um, point, this is also a phenomenon of most people in our society. Also the tendency to go over the border with the excessive physical activity, something which is a tendency. The duty ideas, you know that, I think have changed over the years. They have been different ideas of beauty. And there's the effect I can see now of the second generation that today's parents, they have also, they already have grown up with a slimness idea like this Twiggy here, you can see this is a very um, first time it was a very, very slim uh, body ideal. Um, and that was in the 60s. And parents of nowadays children, they have already grown up with that. So in a lot of families, there's a lot of talking about at the dinner table, about dieting, about calories, about what you shouldn't eat, about healthy food or unhealthy food. Um, and so all these problems are passed to the next generation at an earlier age. So maybe you, as you're young, have already grown up from very young with all this talk at it's not in every family, of course, but it's a, it's a tendency. This is a growing concern about children eating the wrong things, becoming uh, obese and things like that. It starts in primary school that children are worried about their bodies and uh, all these things. Also, we have to, we have unlearned to find normal body shapes beautiful. The normal body shape, which like, how we look like is not the thing we see in all these um, 
pictures we see all the time online and in the magazines and in the shows we see so many um, super slim uh, models and and uh, you can see for example in the middle you see this um, figure which is completely unrealistic the, the legs so thin and then a, a, a breast like of the size like that's completely impossible but that's what what young girls are confronted with and we haven't learned to find things like that beautiful there was this campaign of Dove that they wanted to use models like that for to, to show how normal women for ads for to show how normal women have body shape is what it's like but um, this does not lead to an augmentation of the uh, numbers of of selling so this is something that is not um, useful for these companies so they have um, left this uh, already time trends over the time this has is, has uh, increased the striving for slimness in the younger generation the body image is worse in the younger generation there are numerous studies that can show that and the age of anorexia nervosa the age of onset is decreasing so um, this is uh, and we have seen a phenomenon now with the corona pandemic that we have increased numbers of eating disorders um, everywhere so it was not only in switzerland but in everywhere in, in the western world we have seen that um, with the lockdown being more at home eating more by yourself uh, watching the mirror and getting worried about your uh, body so also maybe more depression things like that leads to more eating disorder systems in individuals so the numbers have increased with that it's also about this is a student survey in, in Zurich where you see that a lot of girls want to be slimmer and it's not obese uh, girls but everybody so 50 percent and also, it's not only the girls. Uh, the girls, they have special problems. I will come to that later. But 75% um, uh, of boys want to be more muscular. So it's an increasing worry of the younger boys already that their body is not perfect and they have to do, um, they have to go in the gym and uh, do the workout to, to build up muscle. Uh, a phenomenon of the younger generation nowadays than it used to be. So why are young women in particular so, so susceptible to sickening ideals? Look at that. These are some ideals. And if you, if you watch that, can you tell me, can anybody tell me something that is striking with these ideals? If you compare the male ideal to the female idea. Do you have an idea, something that is striking? If you see the male ideal, it is quite male, isn't it? It's a, so the ideal for a young man is to be as male as possible. And the ideal for the young woman is to be as less, as little female as possible. So it's not a real female idea, it's more an androgen idea. And this, make, is, this is what makes the puberty of young women especially difficult. Excuse me? Um, yeah? I, I see. One question, yeah? No, uh, I see another answer in the chat. Pardon? Uh, so um, someone wrote that uh, he or she felt that being able to see women's ribs and the men's drive to be thicker. So ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So it's quite, this is an, a very, this ideal is a very, the, the male ideal is also quite difficult to achieve, but it's not so unhealthy. That is maybe uh, also different. And here you see the ribs and it's very, yeah, it's very unhealthy, the idea. Yes. Okay, so we have the 
stigma of obesity, which is the, in German we say, the andere Seite der Medaille. Can anybody translate the other side of the, the I don't know the expression, uh, the andere Seite der Medaille. Anybody knows in English? No. Um, I, see, I see an answer in the chat on the flip side. Yeah. What is it? The other, or other side of the coin. Ah, the other side of the coin. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Because the other side of the coin is that obesity is extremely, uh, has an extreme stigma in our society. So if you, there are studies that show that if you ask people for what do they associate with, the, uh, with someone who is overweight, then you associate that this was a lot of negative qualities like stupid, lazy, slow and everything. So people with, uh, who are overweight um, are confronted with a lot of prejudice and um, the, the uh, overweight children are the most unpopular playmates. So this is also an, a, a very big problem. Okay, so in our society food is often mentioned in, in the media a lot but it's usually it's about diet calories fat good fats bad fat everything we should eat we shouldn't eat and this pyramid you all know that which is interesting but it's not something like fun and eat is eat is that that does not have a good connotation it's more like bad uh, it, it, you have to always to be worried about the food. And there are a lot of myths that are in the, the uh, media uh, that you can divide in healthy and unhealthy foods, which is not true. For example, a lot of people think carbohydrates are very bad or fat is very bad or something like that is not true because we all need carbohydrates. We all need fat. It's only a, it's a question of the amount. So it's not per se that you have unhealthy food. It's, it's, it depends on how much you eat about it. And um, also it's not um, true that diets reduce body weight. Why not? Because the most frequent effect of dieting is that body weight is increased because of the, um, about, uh, fed uh, in in the in in the hormones there's changes in your hormones that lead to an increased um, um, building of fat cells after dieting and you can measure this one year after the diet so there are um, this the yo-yo effect you have all heard about it is not only that you tend to eat more after a diet it is also a somatical uh, phenomenon of your body that leads to uh, changes in your um, in your hormone um, that lead to increased increasement of the body uh, weight okay so and Usually there's a lot of recommendation what kind of diet you should follow, but it's very, uh, especially at young age, it's, it's quite of dangerous to follow a diet because it leads to more body weight on the one hand or to eating disorders on the other hand. So, and um, this is a reason why you should not go on a diet is because um, you get more overweight or you have a risk for eating disorder. Dieting is always a risk factor. So in, in my book, I have wrote, written more about this in the first uh, part of the book about all these aspects I have talked about now. I have also there uh, some uh, suggestions how to change the situation, which I have written here about. Um, there should be warnings on diet advertisements, a minimum biome for models, youth impact assessment for casting shows or for food advertising and also prevention programs in schools. Um, in the second and the third part of the book, I'm referring uh, more to the individual part of the eating disorder, which I will talk now about. But um, before I come to that, maybe, um, you have some questions or remarks you want to ask now, you can write in the chat or you can also 
um, just talk. It's possible because we're not so many people here. But if you talk, maybe you could also put on your camera that we can see you. Is there some remark or question? No, not yet. So I will go on. Um, I talk about the BMI, which is, uh, I, I think you know that it's the weight divided by the height squared. And there we have the normal weight range, which is about 20 to 25, uh, or the gray zone starting from 18.5 to 20, which is also normal for young people. Um, but in the underweight under 17.5 and overweight over 25. Um, now, what is an anorexia nervosa, an eating disorder? This is, a, this is the definition here you see here. It is a low body weight, but it's also only if it's an intentional weight loss through reduced caloric intake. And it's also this excessive fear of weight gain, which leads to a very um, it's kind of a weight phobia and uh, um, those who are affected they usually tend not to want to go to the treatment in the beginning of this the anorexia nervosa because they have so, such a great fear that the treatment might help them to gain weight which they really really don't want it's kind of a horror so this is so difficult because the Anorexia nervosa has a first phase where, where people want to keep their eating disorder. I mean, the rear means, means the period uh, stops. And there are some other symptoms which are quite frequent if, if, if the dieting really becomes an eating disorder now. And I, I have written here these phenomenons. Um, also, it's possible the, that you have uh, vomiting after, after the meals. It's not only in the uh, um, bulimia nervosa, it can also be in the anorexia nervosa, and uh, the counting the calories, weighing all the time, a concern about your body shape, um, and sometimes excessive drinking or reduced drinking, which is very dangerous if, the people, uh, if people don't drink the affected people don't drink enough. Yeah. And this is also a phenomenon. You can have this without an eating disorder or as a first sign, this is constant body checking, always looking into the mirror, constantly weigh, weighing or checking your cheeks, arms, belly, thighs, whether these are, they are too fat. It can be very sustain, sustaining for the eating disorder. Bulimia nervosa is um, also the other side of the coin is, is, is an eating disorder that often follows the, um, the anorexia nervosa phase. It's often, often after anorexia nervosa, you uh, can um, go to the bulimia nervosa. I have to turn on my light, which is kind of it's automatically. Wait a moment. It has a sensor, if I don't move enough, it lowers the lights. Okay, um, bulimia nervosa uh, is eating attacks with loss of control, constant preoccupation with food, and it's kind of the sister of the anorexia nervosa. It has very similar features, but they, uh, those affected are not so underweight because they have these eating attacks. And after the attack, they attempt to counteract by vomiting or by starvation or excessive exercising. Okay, this is, uh, maybe you know bulimia nervosa, uh, less well-known is binge eating disorder, which is quite the same thing uh, with the eating attacks, um, but you have not, no um, vomiting after the eating attack. And the bulimia, Bulimia nervosa and binge eating usually is an eating disorder where you feel very, very guilty after, after these episodes, after these eating attacks and the vomiting. Uh, something. And, and over the life course, eating disorder diagnosis changes. This is a study that shows that um, 
a lot of people go from anorexia, anorexia nervosa to bulimia nervosa or to atypical eating disorders or the other way around, which is less common, but also possible. So is, you have transdiagnostic therapeutic strategies. So when I talk about therapy afterwards, how, how do we treat the eating disorder and how do we prevent it? Then it's more for all eating disorders, a similar therapies and stress, therapeutic and strategies transdiagnostic because it's I said it's like the sister is similar these eating disorders okay is there a question about diagnosis or about these phenomena I was talking about symptoms or something like that no no question okay um now the origin model how does it work how do you get an eating disorder and I have to say that um, there are a lot of predispositional factors and triggering factors, but quite normal persons can come into the eating disorder. It's not that you have to be very um, weird or, psych or psychopathological to get into the eating disorders and you can come from a normal family and afterward, you are in a kind of devil circle with psychological problems and solution attempt of the eating disorder, which leads to secondary psychological and physical consequences like depression, anxiety, obsession, compulsion, and starvation consequences, consequences, bodily consequences that lead to more problems and conflicts and even lower self-esteem. So you get in this vicious circle, uh, which is really a vicious circle, where it's very difficult to get out. And that's why we, our, our strategy is to overcome this or to prevent this is, you have to like to go in very early and to have these prevention strategies very early. About family and eating disorders this is a very interesting part, topic because a lot of people think that parents are, or families are kind of guilty but that the, the children or uh, the young adults get into the eating disorder. Um, it's quite frequently not like that, not like there might, might be familiar factors that help you to get into the, or that the lead uh, are a kind of a, a supporting factor to, 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 for the eating disorder, but also, um, Difficult situation of families can be a consequence of the eating disorder because families that are in the eating disorder, it's only not only those affected uh, have the symptoms, but the others suffer with them. And uh, usually this leads to very difficult situations between these um, family members. And so one of our strategies is to have the families to support their adolescent or young adults to come out of the eating disorder. And the first thing is we detect the vicious circle, which is also in the family, not only for the individual, that the eating disorder talk dominate everyday life. They have ongoing discussion about the same topics, about the meals. Someone has the microphone on. Yeah, me, uh, sorry. Um, there is a question in the chat. So how common is it that people change in their eating disorders and how often can this happen for a single individual? So it's referring to the circular graph slide. I didn't quite understand. <laughs> can you please repeat? I didn't understand uh, everything. Oh, sorry. And or can you see the chat? So there is a question in the chat. Yes, maybe I can see the chat. I think they're referring to uh, the slide prior to the next one where you have this uh, this graph with all the uh, individual causes. Ah, uh, how often is it that they, yeah, I know I see how often is that they change. I didn't, I understand, I'm sorry. Can now go to the next slide. Yeah, okay. How, how frequently is that? Um, this is an, a, a study that um, and the, this um, picture shows with the thickness of the arrows, the frequency. This is, in, uh, is a picture out of the study and um, it is quite frequent. So you can see that the, the one 
um, where the thickest arrow here symbolizes that the most frequent cause of the eating disorder is from anorexia to bulimia, and then from there to the atypical eating disorder. And also a lot of those get healthy. If you want to have these in numbers, how often is this? This is about one third of the anorexia nervosa population comes into another eating disorder. And is once about one third get um, longer, uh, long course of the illness and about 5% um, die. So the prognosis is um, quite difficult in young adulthood. But it's also possible in the younger generation that is treated early that a lot of them get out of the eating disorder. So it's about 50% that get out of the eating disorder. Also, there is some kind of a risk to have a depression afterwards and other mental illness. So this is about roughly the numbers. Thank you for the question. So um, I, I, I have uh, been talking about the eating disorder atmosphere in families and um, the vicious circle that, because they talk a lot about this, this supports the ongoing of the eating disorder. And so we have to help them to get out of this. We help them to distinguish between the symptoms of the eating disorder and the personality of those affected, which is very important because uh, it's always mixed up that you say this, um, but you don't cannot um, divide or really um, understand um, to distinguish between the personal aspects. And it's not the a fault of that person. It's really an illness, the symptoms. For example, that they hide the food or that they are not um, honest with, with their caregivers. And we, we try to teach them useful communication strategies. Um, don't always discuss details, see the bigger picture, talk about feelings, not about food, ask what kind of help is useful. This is also important if you know someone with an eating disorder, talk about feelings, don't talk about details and ask what kind of support is useful and reflect your own way of communication. Parents should do that, friends should do that, partners should do that, because if you always, um, sometimes we say it's like a kangaroo, you like to support the other person too much, you want to uh, do the everything for them, or um, it should be more that you ask them and then they tell you how what the best help is, what helps and what not. Um, anorexia affects the whole body and this picture shows um, all the, the areas where um, the eating disorder can affect. Um, usually the, the patients that are affected don't realize that in the beginning, they don't want to talk about this, but after a while it becomes more and more obvious that it's been very unhealthy thing and it, it, it really um, destroys the whole body. Um, uh, this is a lot of information on one slide. If everybody, if anybody is interested in the slides, I can um, send them to, for example, the um, uh, here the uh, person that uh, leads the talk and then I can, you can get the, the slides. Okay. Um, what keeps the eating disorder going? Because it's very hard to overcome if it's, it's going on for years. Um, this is some um, factors, physical factors, psychological factors and external factors. And if you look at the physical factors, it's things like um, um, you feel full. It's not only that you say you feel full after eating a small amount of food, it's, also, it's, it's a, due to a slowed gastrointestinal activity. Also, hunger can release endorphins in the brain. And this leads to the feeling that you, you are, the, the patients, they sometimes they say, I'm, I, 
I don't feel bad about this. I, uh, the body perception is distorted. They don't see that they are too thin. And then they say, I feel really full of energy and I, I, I'm not in a bad state, not mentally and not uh, with my body. This is uh, also because of the release of endorphin that sometimes uh, um, is very um, sus sustaining for the eating disorder. Um, the urge to move as a somatic consequence of the state of hunger. Um, there are also a lot of psychological factors like the proudness about the achievement. Sometimes it's really those effects are very proud that they have achieved uh, being thinner than everybody. Um, also, you can avoid the life tasks through being ill can be a factor or the positive feedback, feedback of others about the weight loss, getting attention for being eating disorder. So there are a lot of factors that, uh, and that le it leads to, this is a, of our own study we, about motivational issues, the motivational state of those who come to our patients in, in the first uh, phase of anorexia nervosa. These are young patients and these uh, stages, they mean, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And you see there are very small population in our patients that wants to, that are in the state of action. They really want to change their eating disorder. Some are in preparation, but most are pre-contemplation or contemplation. That means it's very difficult in the first phase to motivate and now about treatment, what do we do to motivate someone to get out of this? It's a lot of talk about, not about only, you don't talk, only talk about eating disorder, we also talk about life. What do you miss in your life? When, if you, what are the advantages and the disadvantages in the long run, for example, if you keep or not keep the eating disorder? And you, you will, this, we talk about ambivalence because they want to overcome the eating disorder and they want to keep it. And there, these are the, the mo uh, in, in most studied and uh, um, evidence-based therapies, cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorder in young adults. This is the best uh, um, possibility to treat it. Um, and there's a lot about motivational work in the beginning. You should work on the motivation because otherwise it's not working. You cannot treat someone who doesn't want to be treated. Self-determination has to be respected in this phase. And af only after in the second phase, if you get deeper and the person is motivated to really work, then you can uh, work on the background of the eating disorder. Maybe it's a trauma or personality disorders but it's not always like that as i said also quite healthy personality um, can become uh, eating disordered so it's not everybody has deep trauma or personality disorders who who um, develops an eating disorder but if necessary if there's this is a point then you do this in the second phase of the treatment and uh, a lot of it is about behavioral change. So it's in this therapy, it's not like we talk and talk and talk and then the eating disorder is gone, goes away. It's like you try, you try to do something to not have the binging attack, to like to overcome the diet, to eat more. And then you analyze the effect of doing so. And then this reinforces the positive uh, circle. So if you, don't do things and don't do, do this experiments therapy is not working. Also it's about life energy. Um, I sometimes we draw this circle and we see that most of the life energy is in the eating disorder, body shape, weight issues, everything like that and nothing is left for family friend job studies. And do you want to ha have this for all your future? Maybe not. And so all this is about the work in the first phase of the therapy. And also we reflect about the thinking style because people that are eating disorders tend to have an inflexible thinking style. 
Um, it's about relationships because relationships can also help you out of the eating disorder and motivate you to get out of the eating. This is uh, eating disorders is also a very, very important aspect of the therapy. And um, also these factors I was, I've been talking about the vicious circle with relatives or with friends and that others individual factors that might keep your anorexia or eating disorder going. So if you have like in your surroundings, some people that might be affected, what are the early signs of early detection? Um, physically is every rapid weight loss is a very bad sign. Even if someone is overweight, could be the first state of an eating disorder. So visible rapid weight loss is a very alarming sign. Low blood pressure and pulse. This leads to low body temperature, cold hand, cold feet. And Lanuco hair, this is very small hairs like the babies have in the arms and legs. And uh, loss, hair loss, in the um, head, dry skin, things like that. And chubby cheeks, cheeks in spite of underweight might be a sign of, a, of swollen salivary glands, which is an effect of the vomiting. And behavioral signs might be that someone always disappears after the meals, constantly feeling cold, staying close to the heating, white clothes to hide the body, social withdrawal, which is quite a frequent uh, phenomenon in eating in the beginning eating disorder always talking about body shape in a ne negative way and avoidance of social situations with food. If a friend never goes to the eating chair meetings at the, for example, at the university, there might all be signs, the avoidance of these situations that you, someone might be in danger. So now here I have some questions. <laughs> I have these, I, I leave this for you to read. Am I at risk for an eating disorder? If you ask yourself, then ask yourself these questions that might help you to find out. I'll leave you for this to read. I'll give you some time. I think all this you have heard before, this, these are the early signs. Um, it's usually if, if you are at risk for an eating disorder, you, you realize that you tend to have, to, to have too much time of the day. You think about all these issues. And you, then when you begin to realize that these, these thoughts keep you from, from concentrating, focusing on social situations, on your studies, on, on your work, and then this might be a sign, the pre preoccupation. Of course, also the weight loss. But it's this is for eating disorder starts in the mind. So this is quite important to ask yourself these questions. Um, and what could you do now? I mean, this might be a question for us. Maybe someone is here that is here because you have some uh, of in uh, some person you love or your friend with um, with an eating disorder. How can you help? What can you do? Very important it is not to like to talk too much in the beginning, but to listen. What, and then after listening and really understand, try to understand, formulate your concern. Respect, as I said, self-determination, because it's not possible to like to, to, to force someone out of the eating disorder. But you can ask what kind of support would be helpful. How can you help? If not, um, you can always advise to seek professional help and to help to find, for example, an address of someone that is trustable. But if help is not accepted, I think it's very important to stay in the relation, to stay friends, stay in contact, and try again sometime later. So 
um, for, for a lot of people that are affected by eating disorder, they tell me, everybody sees, uh, talks to me only about the eating disorder and I am not the eating disorder. I am a person, I'm a friend. And so I think it's very important for these people that we um, worship them as persons and not only talk about this topic, but also formulate your concern and try from time to time to, to formulate what your worries are, why you feel worried, and then help them to get the help they need. Um, also very important, the last two points, that if you have a friend or a sister or a neighbor, something like that, you are not a th therapist, so you cannot take on any therapeutic test and you're not responsible. So it's also very important. You can offer your help and you can give it some advice and formulate your worry, but not like, get into the role that being that you are responsible for that this person gets the help she needs because this I'm talking about adult persons that are affected. Of course, if you are if you're a mother of a child, it's different, then you're responsible. And if the child is 12, then you're responsible and you have to take this child to see a doctor as early as possible. So this is a very different situation if you're a parent. Of a child of a minor, then I see the responsibility in the parents to bring this child as early as possible to some person that might help. But this uh, slide shows how to to react to a, 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 an adult that this might be affected. Yeah. So there what is was it, and now we have some time to discuss. Um, maybe for the discussion, we can turn on the at as many cameras as possible so that I can see you. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's much easier to discuss if you, if you open your cameras. If you are in a situation where this is possible. <laughs> okay. So now, um, do you have any questions or information to share or um, remarks to my talk? Please feel free. You cannot say anything wrong. Yeah, I see a question in the uh, chat. I had a question that I wrote down. OK, maybe you can. I, I asked about how can we sort of combine recovering from an eating disorder while still maintaining self-love, because I see that a lot of people feel uh, sort of that they can't love what is unhealthy or they cannot love, they feel like once they realize that they have an eating disorder, that they are flawed and that they can't really love what's unhealthy and they fear losing self-confidence when they finally admit that they need help. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I don't quite get what you mean by love. As a love to unhealthy things, or love to to um, friends, or or a loved one. Or I, I didn't quite get what you mean by this. Can you can you again explain how you mean the question? Sorry, I I really don't understand what you mean. It's a sort of link between how can you still maintain self-confidence and self-love, self-appreciation mm -hmm. whilst admitting that you need help and that you're- Ah, okay, now I get what you mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think um, the self-worth um, can be maintained by realizing that getting help is much more difficult than withdrawing and not getting help. So I really admire those people who overcome an eating disorder and admit to themselves and to others that they have this illness and that they need help. It is a very bad um, presumption that help is something bad, that it diminishes your self-worth or that you should like be uh, completely... I, I always say to, to these um, patients, you cannot 
draw yourself on your own hair out of the mud. It's not possible. It's and it's I is a sign of a strong character to overcome an eating disorder and to fight against it. What we do is kind of, it's called externalization. We say the anorexia is not you. The, you have your personality with a lot of good um, features and personality traits that are so worthable, valuable. And on the other side, the anorexia is there. And by fighting the anorexia, then your um, good um, yeah, personality traits can, can come out again. So it's a lot of about in the therapy is about um, recovering your own self and not being constantly in the in this um, assumption that a, a, a thin body is the basis of my self-worth. But this is also a, a problem in our society that a lot of people, a lot of people think that the way you look like or your body is is the basic of your self worth. So you all, it's not your individual problem. It's, it's not only you, the person affected, or the, the patient that has this problem. Every all have this kind of these problems. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, is there other remarks or question? Could you please have a, yes, yes, thank you. What are your thoughts on orthorexia? Okay, I think this is a very important phenomenon in 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 our now our days. Um, I respect very much people who are vegan, for example, um, because it's a very I, I think they raise very important issues about our food, about animals and things like that but example for example being vegan is a higher risk for getting an eating disorder why because you need a lot of preparation and a lot of thinking about the food and thinking about the food is always a risk for an eating disorder but being for example vegan is not an eating disorder and it's not orthorexia orthorexia is the phenomenon that you think so much about what is the right way to eat that you eat not enough calories and that you lose weight because of that. So it's kind of an anorexia, but not because you want to be slim, but because you want to always eat the right thing and not eating the wrong fats and the wrong carbohydrates and the wrong this and the wrong that. And it also can be like, for example, being vegan or being or always thinking too much about these things. So if you have kind of a special style of eating, then you should really be aware, not think too much about it, it to get in your everyday life, um, enjoying food and meals without thinking a lot about the context, about the, about the, about the content of the food. So this is a very important thing. And orthorexia is, an, is a very um, um, growing phenomenon nowadays, phenomenon, and we should be aware that it's not healthy to think too much about what you eat and when you eat and why you eat. We also should enjoy food. Okay, then is why do the doctors in clinics first treat the weight and not mentally? Yeah. This is a very good question. <laughs> I think it's because in a certain state of the anorexia, when the body weight is very low, um, there are some patients that really you cannot treat them mentally because they are so much in the eating disorder vicious circle that they don't listen at all. So you have to start with gaining some weight and after that you can start to talk. But I have seen also patients that are very traumatized by this. So what we try to do is to get some mental therapy in the beginning, motivational work, so that it's not completely against their will, the first weight gain. So, but the reason why they treat uh, first the weight is because it's so dangerous, this first thing, so that everybody's worried that the person might die if the if he or she doesn't start eating now right away. So everybody's very worried. And 
um, this is one thing. And the second thing is that some patients simply can't listen if they are really underweight, a lot of uh, very low weight and uh, very much in the mental state of anorexia. And they only can start listening after gaining like five or six kilograms. But there is also some, I think a lot of mistakes are made by forcing the patients, adult patients too much. And then they really hate the clinic and they're the therapist and then no therapy is working. So it's a balance you have to get. And she, uh, the Inia writes, I see, but isn't it often also a cause of depression? Uh, yes, that's true. But depression is also, if you know, every very underweight anorexic patient is also depressed. So only after gaining some kilogram, you can see if depression is the result of the underweight or the underlying condition. So you should share, first you some, gain some kilogram and then maybe you come out of the depression or not. And if you see you don't come out of the depression, then you can treat the depression afterwards. But depression can also be a consequence of the underweight and you cannot talk away the depression while the patient stays underweight. It's not possible. So in these cases, that's the reason. Yeah, excuse me. I see there is a question you might have like skipped. So yeah. Claudia wrote that a friend of her is eating for many years ketogen. Is that healthy? And is it also a kind of eating disorder? It is not an eating disorder, but it can lead to an eating disorder. And it's not healthy. The studies show it's not healthy. No, uh, there are a lot of side effects uh, of the ketogen um, dieting and it's not very um, good for every, every aspect of your body development, but um, um, not everybody who does this is eating disordered, of course. I don't know, I don't know if she is underweight. She might be underweight because this is kind of a risk. Um, uh, also some affections can result in, of the uh, intestinal tract and things like that. So I don't know if, the, if it might be, uh, might lead to an eating disorder or being an eating disorder. It depends how much the person thinks about this all the time, how much she is affected in, in her thoughts, because eating disorder is, a, is not mainly only the underweight, but it's, it's, it's a, um, an illness of them, a mental illness. It's a cognitive dysfunction. And I don't know anything about this person, so I, I can't answer. Mm -hmm. Any other question in the chat that I have overlooked? No, I don't think so. So you can maybe put another question. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who is a therapist and he also used to work with young girls that were uh, suffering from some type of eating disorder. And he told me about this one incident a while ago where he said that um, he had this sort of exercise in therapy where they would uh, he would ask uh, his patients to, to take a rope and he would ask them what they think uh, the circumference of their, their belly or their hips were. And they would uh, do that and lie that rope on the floor. And then he would ask them to lie on the rope and take a photo. And um, well, he saw that they, they completely overestimated the circumference. And so he showed them the photo, but their first impulse was to say, well, that can't be right. So um, the, the photo was somehow, <laughs> something must be wrong with the photo. Manipulated, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, but this is like, a, mm -hmm. so it seems like uh, this uh, self image of their body seems to play a big role. And I was wondering, uh, how do you go? How do you go about that in therapy? Like, what can you do to convince some th someone uh, of the fact that they might have a distorted view of their own body? Because I, I can imagine it must be very hard for the patient to process this, this fact and to change it. Yes. Um, it's a very, very good question, very important question. 
Um, we also do this exercise, it's a common exercise, uh, which is a, an attempt to show the patient that they have the body distortion, the, the affected body perception, that they see themselves differently from what our others see them and also different from reality. But um, we know that the, all these strategies, there are other strategies with the video therapy. We, we film them from behind. So sometimes they can see when, when they are confronted with the mirror, they say, I'm fat. But if you film, make a video from behind, then they might see themselves differently and see that they are not that fat. So it's possible. But we also have seen that this is not a miraculous tool, all these things, like the um, experience of your friend that is a therapist. Um, if they are affected very much by the eating disorder, then this does not work. And I always tell them, of course, psychoeducational, that they have this distortion. And I ask them what they think about it. If they believe or not believe, I show them the photos of others and things like that. And I do these exercises, but I also tell them, I can promise you one thing. If we work here for half a year, then this will be better, even if this exercise does not work. So uh, it's also some a thing not to like to have a tool to a wonder tool that works on this body perception topic. It's also uh, uh, the point of the um, meaning that has body perception in um, relation to other other aspects of my life and it, it, it and after half a year everything is better why because they think it's not the most important thing of the world to be thin but I have recovered that my friend I have realized that my friends are more important my partner is more important my parents are more important my school is more important my studies so um, you work on if, if it doesn't work the tools that we use for the to, to, to treat the body perception, then we work on the other parts of the life and the self-worth. And as much as this grows, as much decreases the symptoms, these cognitive symptoms, it's a cognitive symptom. So there's a part of the patients that where the tools help, a part of the patients where simply eating helps and all this disappears. It's also possible about one of third of our young patients that have eating disorder for a short time the body perception issue disappears only by gaining weight. And there's one third where it needs more time. And by becoming other, uh, other parts of your life, becoming more important and gaining um, importance in your life with the, your relations, you lose these symptoms. So there are different ways out of the eating disorder. In the okay. Yeah. Oh, an interesting question. Yeah, you have all very interesting questions here, I think. Another one? I would have a question. Um, I was wondering what you'd say that recovery actually looks like, because um, because I've heard sometimes that people just sort of learn to live with it, or is it something that patients can be completely free of or I also heard of grown up people that say um that they have sort of like a number with their weights that they know they can't fall below because otherwise they might fall into um the illness again. Yeah this depends on the length of the eating disorder and there are some people that get almost completely free as free as we are all of these symptoms because we all have a little bit of them. Um, but if you have eating disorder for like more than two or three years, usually there are some rest symptoms that rest, that remain. And um, it's very important to, to find out how to live with them. And as you said, it's exactly like that. Um, you have to like know the early uh, signs uh, that might um, lead to a backlash uh, for these uh, type of patients. But there, it's, it's not, I, I, you should not lose hope. <laughs> these friends, for example, you have talked to, um, 
because um, I have seen patients that have been eating disorder for a long time. And after, for example, three or four years, they had a, some symptoms. And like five years later, sometimes when becoming a mother or when having a different partner or something changes in life, then this can, or after a long time, this can, can become better. So it's, it's sometimes it's a very long and slow way out. But of course, um, so a lot of these patients, like about one third have to live with some amount of long life symptoms. This is also, is also true, as you said. Yeah. So it's very much dependent on your life course and on the length of the eating disorder, both. Mm -hmm. So I see a question, uh, some questions in the chat. So Miguel asked, how do we go about looking for help? Okay, if you are um, a young adult, as you are, most of, I can't see everybody, but I think most of you are, um, then you get help. Um, you, a very good address is the uh, University Hospital in Zurich, um, which is... Uh, uh, they have the special uh, outpatient department for uh, this Klinik für Konsejahrpsychiatrie um, und Psychosomatik from University Hospital of Zurich. Um, and this very good address, they also have addresses of therapists that are in private practice. And um, the Swiss Society of Eating Disorders, Schweizerische Gesellschaft für Essstörungen, SGES, is a society that has a homepage. And there you have the addresses of a lot of therapists that are specialized in the different uh, regions of Switzerland. Schweizerische Gesellschaft für Essstörungen. Um, in every part of Switzerland, there's, uh, and there are addresses on this homepage for. Uh, of specialists, yeah. Uh, and then, very interesting. So someone can also be depressed because he is not eating enough and this does not have to be connected with wanting to lose weight. That's really true, yes. So you can be not eating disordered primarily, you get depressed, you eat less, and then you get in a vicious circle. This is possible. Uh, and then have an eating disorder um, without, uh, it, it does not have to be connected with wanting to lose weight and to have an eating disorder. This is correct. Does there exist a name for this? It seems not to fit into the categories, or am I wrong? Yes, um, there, um, there is the, um, uh, there's an, a type of eating disorder, which is in not every, uh, Diagnostic manual, but in the DSM-5, which is a category of uh, eating disorders that are um, atypical and that um, are not connected with wanting to lose weight, but other emotional reasons. Yeah? And, and this uh, eating disorder um, is, is called... Um, it was, um, now it's, this is an atypical eating disorder. It's also in the ICD-10, which is our diagnostic manual. And it's, it's quite common. It's not the most common eating disorder, but it's quite common that um, you can lose weight because of other emotional reasons that can be trauma, depression, or things like that. And also we see that some of these persons develop very typical uh, secondary symptoms of the eating disorder, but it was not the main beginning of the of of the uh, of this phase of the it was a dieting or I want to lose weight. Yeah, so it's not not very rare to have this. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't fit in the categories I've mentioned, but at the, that there is this category of the atypical eating disorder. Okay, another question. Hmm. 
No, it doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> okay, so maybe I I send the uh, slides to Chris and you. Do I say it right? No, you. <laughs> How do I say your name? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yes, I will send you the slides. So you can send them to all those who have inscribed in this session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone is saying thank you. That's nice. <laughs> OK, uh, a lot of people are saying thank you. That's nice. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you for being here. I, I, I like your. Um, as an audience and I, the questions were very interesting and challenging and also i, I really appreciate the, this organization of the of this um i think it is a quite a good thing that you have this organization now at the university and the eth so i i really um wish you good luck with this activity and i hope many of the audience will join you to organize further events in this um yeah yeah thank you very much yeah, and um, please tell us what impressed you and what could have been done better by filling out the survey I sent in the chat. And if you want to join us, you're very welcome. And please reach us out in the link you can find out if you Google me well. Yeah. Okay, someone wrote, can I have the slides too? Please, sadly, I wasn't able to join earlier. Okay, so I can think you can send these slides to everybody that has subscribed. So everybody will get that. Okay. Good. So I wish Thank you, you very much. A good evening. Goodbye.